This is Crete, Megalon Nisi, the big island. To the ancient Greeks, this was a dark and troubling place, where the appetites of a frightful monster could only be appeased with a tribute of human flesh. This was the Minotaur's island, with a sinister labyrinth at its heart. Just over a hundred years ago, a British archaeologist called Arthur Evans came here to unearth the roots of these myths. He found a people lost to history for thousands of years. He called them the Minoans. The rediscovery of this sophisticated Bronze Age civilization astonished the world. Evans believed his Minoans were unique a culture that, thanks to its island home, had kept the rest of the world at bay, while it quietly developed into Western Europe's first civilization. But new discoveries have revolutionized our understanding of the Minoans, adding fascinating layers of complexity to Evans' first draft. From their origins 5,000 years ago to their dramatic collapse some 2,000 years later, it's now clear that they were connected by the sea to the world around them, rather than separated by it. Island races have the reputation for being a little arrogant and self-absorbed. But in Minoan times, if you wanted not just to survive, but to build a civilization, you had to reach out across the horizons to make new connections. The Minoans were islanders, but they weren't insular. Many good things came to Bronze Age Crete by way of the sea. The raw materials from which the Minoans fashioned their civilization. But the sea also brought bad things. Natural catastrophes and man-made calamities. And finally, as recent archaeological research has revealed, it would be a combination of sea-borne disasters that would cause the eclipse of Minoan civilization and its journey into the Shadowlands of Myth. This is Moklos, a tiny humpbacked island moored off the north coast of Crete. If you want to understand how the sea shaped the destiny of Minoan civilization, this is the place to come. Moklos was first settled 5,000 years ago and so belongs to the very beginning of the Minoan story. This busy town's prosperity depended above all on its port the gateway that connected it to the wider world of the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean. Just three weeks sailing could land the exotic wares of Egyptian merchants from the south on these shores. Next stop east is Cyprus, and beyond that, the Old Testament ports of Tyre, Byblos and Sidon. Head due north and you hit the Greek mainland and the great ancient city of Mycenae. This was a prehistoric trade centre and provided welcome dry land and a good meal for the travelling salesmen of the sea. Little wonder that Crete has been called a stepping stone for the continents. years ago, when Arthur Evans was making the first dramatic discoveries at Knossos, it was natural to stress the originality and distinctiveness of the Minoans. Evans conjured up a seductive vision of what he called a free and independent people, flourishing on their island home. But the most up-to-date research paints a rather different picture. From the very beginning, the Minoans ventured out into the world beyond their shores, 
because they lacked the material that defined their age. Bronze. An alloy of copper and tin, bronze is amazingly versatile. You can use it to make anything, from a precision stone cutter to an eight-foot two-man saw. It was to the Minoans what the microchip is to us, the technology on which the progress of their civilization depended. Thanks to its geographical position, close to the more advanced cultures of the Middle East, the secrets of bronze manufacture came early to Crete. It was probably introduced by migrants from Cilicia, present-day Turkey, some 5,000 years ago, a thousand years before it arrived in Britain. Though they weren't natives, these settlers can claim to be the first Minoans, an advance guard from the future whose arrival put Crete one step ahead in the civilization stakes. But without regular supplies of copper and tin, Minoan Crete was in danger of slipping back into the Stone Age. There was only one option, to take to the seas. The ancient Greeks would have assumed that a legendary king like Minos would have had a powerful fleet at his disposal to see off pirates, to intimidate his neighbours, to bring in supplies for his population when necessary. But in the Bronze Age, this is what sea power was. This is a replica of a boat that went down off the coast of Turkey. It would have had just one sail, room enough for about 24 oarsmen, and it was made of a thin lattice of cypress wood with a cloth skin. In effect, it's nothing more than a giant kayak. But it was frail little vessels like this that headed off, often into hostile waters, packed with goods for barter and exchange, stitching together the cultures of the Eastern Mediterranean. When they set sail in search of copper and tin, the Minoans became players on the world stage. One of the frustrating things about them is the fact that they've left us little or nothing in the way of written records. But that doesn't mean that they left no historical trace. The cultures they came in contact with knew them and recorded them too. Think yourself back to some time in the middle of the 15th century BC. Imagine you're leaving Crete and boarding an Aegean trading vessel heading south to Egypt. After just 21 days traveling, you arrive at the Nile. There you pick up a barge and continue your journey to Thebes. And when you arrive, you're presented with a picture of the Minoans that's very different from the one painted by Arthur Evans. In the Valley of the Kings is the tomb of Rekmire, a high-powered Egyptian bureaucrat. The tomb offers us a snapshot of the people who fell within Egypt's sphere of influence. The people of Punt, or Ethiopia, carry incense trees and animal hides. The Kushites from Nubia have ivory and gold. The retinues from Syria have pots and carts. And this delegation is described as the people of Keftiu. But from what they're carrying, we recognize them as Minoans. The tomb of Rekmire forces you to rethink your mental map, starting with the names. Keftiu rather than Minoans, since that seems to be the name that the Bronze Age Cretans used to describe themselves. And rather than thinking of Crete as a southeastern birthplace of Europe, we should think of it as a northwesterly extension of what we now call the Middle East. Judging from the Cretan products on display in Rekmire's tomb and from other evidence, the Minoans specialized in the production of the desirable rather than the strictly useful. Deluxe pottery, cosmetics, fancy metalwork, and in one recorded case, a pair of fine leather boots. 
They made a name for themselves by taking everyday objects and giving them an unmistakable Minoan spin, doing to the products of the Bronze Age what the Japanese would later do to electronics. But there was one luxury product above all on which the reputation of this remarkable island workshop would have rested. And it started life under the sea. This little mollusk is a murex, a sea snail that feeds off rotting flesh, hence the disgusting smell that you're very lucky not to be experiencing directly. But the Minoans recognised its true potential. They could extract something from this that was worth its weight in silver. It was known simply as purple, a textile dye. If bronze meant sinew and muscle, Purple meant glamour, status and wealth. It was quite simply one of the ancient world's most desirable commodities. The Roman author Pliny described the purple of purples as being the colour of congealed blood. This was imperial purple, reserved for heroes and emperors. The Athenian Aeschylus wrote poetry about it. Poleis, Puparas, is Ageron Kerkida, purple ooze, precious as silver. Discover the past with exclusive ancient history documentaries and ad free podcasts presented by world renowned historians from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of Pompeii to the rebellion of Boudicca and the mysteries of prehistoric Scotland. Immerse yourself in the captivating stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. In classical times, the eastern city port of Tyre was recognised as the source for this precious dye. But recent archaeological work suggests that centuries before, the Minoans might well have pioneered the production of purple. Archaeologists working here at the port of Comos found hundreds of murex dating back to the early Minoan period, many of them with a tiny, precise hole in the shell. Now, this hole isn't man-made, but mollusk-made. In the wild, the murex is a predator as well as a scavenger, hunting down other forms of shellfish, boring into them and then sucking out the insides. The murex here at Comos seem to have had a taste of their own medicine, attacked by their own kind in a mass act of cannibalism. Now, when creatures behave like that, it suggests they're living uncomfortably close to each other. What you might have here is some form of factory farming. Mass production makes sense when you realise it took 12,000 murex to create enough dye to colour the hem of a single garment. Purple would have made the Bronze Age Cretans brand leaders at the luxury end of the Eastern Mediterranean trade. This rare, highly transportable commodity allowed them to exploit not just the needs, but the desires of their age. Every time a Cretan trader sealed a deal at the port of Tyre or the markets of Mycenae, the reputation of the Keftiu and their legendary island would have been magnified. But it wasn't just products that were crossing the seas. People were too. 
All over the Eastern Mediterranean in the Bronze Age, artists, architects and craftsmen were on the move, lent out on a regular basis by rulers keen to impress on other foreign powers the sophistication and calibre of their workforce. Now, once you get creative workers travelling around, people with greedy eyes and a natural curiosity, the possibilities for the cross-pollination of cultures, the interplay of ideas, becomes very real which might just explain the appearance of something entirely new to Crete, the palace. The arrival of these extraordinary and enigmatic buildings, a thousand years or so after the introduction of bronze to the island, marks another significant milestone in the evolution of Minoan culture. So far, palaces have been identified at Knossos and Malia on the north coast, at Zakros in the east, and here at Festos in the south. And archaeologists reckon they're on the scent of two or three more. Each has its own individual features, but they're all variations on the same basic theme of the labyrinth. But who wrote the original? Evidence suggests that around this time, migrant textile workers from Minoan Crete may have been active in Egypt, in which case it's possible that while they were there, they could have indulged in a bit of architectural espionage. The Cretans weren't the first to have a labyrinth. It's thought that honor belongs to the Egyptian kings who built a maze-like tomb near Crocodopolis, the city of crocodiles. The Egyptian labyrinth no longer exists, but it was described by an awestruck Herodotus, the Greek historian who paid it a visit sometime in the 5th century BC. Of its endless rooms and corridors and chambers, he wrote, Metona anthropeon ergon. It's hard to believe that this is the work of men. If someone familiar with the architectural triumphs of classical Greece was impressed, Imagine the impact such a structure would have had when it was first built, around 1800 BC, when the wonders of the world were fewer in number. 1500 years before Herodotus, you can imagine Cretan migrant workers coming back home as fired up as he was, full of stories about a building that baffled the senses and left the visitor awestruck. And as they were building their own masterpieces, perhaps they held that image of the Egyptian labyrinth in their minds. It might have been wiser for the Minoans to study structural engineering rather than honing their fancy design skills, because Crete is earthquake country, the stamping ground of the bull god Poseidon, whose groans and bellows from deep within the earth herald imminent disaster. Around 1700 BC, 200 years after they were built, the first palaces were destroyed in a series of devastating earthquakes. If pleasing the gods was part of the reason for building them, the gods didn't stay pleased for long. It says a lot for the resilience of the Cretans that within 50 years of the calamity, they'd built new palaces on the site of the old ones, bigger and better than those that had been destroyed. But alongside the palaces, a new kind of building began to appear in this period that is just as telling about the kind of place Minoan Crete had become. Country villas, like this one at Vathipetro, surrounded now as it would have been three and a half thousand years ago by its own vineyards. Crete in the Bronze Age was often a troubled and unstable place, rocked by natural disasters and not immune to man-made ones either. But if you'd been able to come here, to Vathipetro around 1600 BC, you would have tasted the good life. Because this was the Minoan Golden Age. The gods were on form, the island was behaving itself, 
You could have relaxed a little, enjoyed the fruits of your civilization. Minoan palaces have been compared to medieval monasteries, which would make Vathi Petra and the other places like it the equivalent of stately homes, the big house for the surrounding area. The main building would have been two, possibly three stories high, with some fine rooms on the east side, perfect for taking in the morning sunshine. In the courtyard was a shrine, and around the back, extensive workshops, so this would have been a hive of activity in its day. But the house's most intimate connection was with the land, the fields of grain, the olive trees, and the vines. This is where Vathi Petro's grapes would have been brought, to this fantastically well-preserved Minoan wine press. This is winemaking at its absolute simplest. You'd have put your grapes in there, kicked off your sandals, clambered in, and started to tread. This region still produces good wine, so it's quite possible that back then, Vathi Petro was the toast of the island. But perhaps the most significant thing about Vathi Petro is what you don't see here. Despite the wealth of Vathi Petro and of other country villas dotted around the island, there's no evidence of any kind of fortification. Now, that's significant. In the same period, over on the Greek mainland, Mycenaean warlords, the forefathers of the generation who would go on to fight the Trojan War, were holed up in fortress palaces, often built on rocky heights, divorced from the settlements down below, strongholds from which they could dominate and into which they could retreat. Here in Minoan Crete, a different spirit prevailed. Seven or eight generations would have known an island of huge palaces, busy towns, prosperous ports, and fine villas set in a peaceful agricultural heartland. A country at ease with itself. But this stable, sophisticated world existed on a knife edge. Within 30 years of being built, Vathi Petro suffered its first, but not its last, earthquake damage. So the world for the Minoans must often have seemed a perilous and frightening place, governed by potent, sometimes vindictive powers who couldn't be understood, only placated. This is the presiding spirit of Minoan Crete in its golden age, its icon and its pin-up girl, the snake goddess. Together with her more diminutive companion, often called the votary, she was discovered by Arthur Evans at Knossos. Evans noted rather primly in his journals her matronly bosom, before going on to describe the quality of the piece, comparing it to the best mice and porcelain. The goddess and her votary make a handsome duo with their fancy, fashionable clothes, their makeup and their jewellery. But all the fine craftsmanship in the world can't disguise the fact something elemental and wild is going on here. The goddess's fierce, wide-eyed stare is matched by her votary's rapt concentration. And that gigantic snake, it must be between eight and ten feet long, grips her in a protective embrace from her slender waist right up to the tip of her headdress. For all her glamour and sexual power, this is a goddess that feeds off respect and fear, not love.
The precise details of Minoan beliefs and rituals have been lost, but tantalising clues remain in seal stones and signet rings, widely used in Minoan Crete's stamps of ownership and identity, and even, it's been speculated, the Bronze Age equivalent of a credit card. Close-up examination of these finely carved artefacts reveals a ritual world of chanting and singing, ecstatic dancing, as well as the famous bull leaping. And playing a leading role throughout are what are clearly female priestesses. For some, these dominant women are proof that the mother goddess was worshipped in Minoan Crete. The cult of this supreme female deity is said to have its roots back in the Stone Age, predating by tens of thousands of years the male-dominated pantheon of gods that we're more familiar with. The mother goddess was said to have authority over everything that really mattered, from the fertility of crops and animals to the movement of the planets. She ruled over life and death, from womb to grave. The existence of one top female god is pretty hotly disputed these days. What seems much more likely is that the island was crammed with a whole host of nature goddesses, each with her own particular area of responsibility, bringing the rain, ripening the corn, keeping those terrifying earthquakes in check. The priestesses were their earthly representatives and may even have had some kind of economic control over the exploitation and distribution of their bounty, a powerful position to be in. But you have to remember in the Bronze Age that man's relationship with nature was much more about negotiation than exploitation. When it took just two bad harvests to wipe out your entire food supplies, you'd have been a fool to take Earth's plenty for granted. So, led by their elegant priestesses, the Minoans would have spent a great deal of time and energy wooing and placating the powers that be. It's long been assumed that the palaces played a key role in the religious rites of Minoan Crete. But there were other kinds of religious experience on offer. Less polished, perhaps, but just as intense. On mountain peaks, in secret palace shrines, deep in sacred caves, narcotics would have played a part in consummating the Minoans' relationship with their gods, bringing them closer to those elusive powers that controlled their lives. One effigy of a blank-eyed goddess has the seed heads of poppies in her diadem, already split open, waiting for the opium to be extracted. A cave like this is eerie and otherworldly enough as it is. You can hear the stalactites growing, faces and figures leap out at you from the rocks. Just imagine what visions you'd have seen if you'd shared in the mind-altering gift of the goddess. Scotino is a place where religious experience would have been raw and intense, where faith was dosed with fanaticism, where followers became true believers. But what happened to those true believers when things started to go wrong, when the deities in whom they'd invested so much suddenly appeared no longer to care? The Minoans were soon to find out. After more than 1,500 years of spectacular progress, something very bad indeed happened to the Minoans in Crete. Sometime around 1450 BC, 
from Vathipetro to Moklos, from Festos to Malia. Towns, ports, country houses and palaces all went up in flames. All, that is, except for the preeminent palace, Knossos. Hataya Triada, you can still see the scorch marks of the fire that raged here three and a half thousand years ago. This was a storeroom packed with pithoi, those giant Alibaba jars, each of which could hold 40 gallons of highly flammable olive oil. When this place went up, it was the Bronze Age equivalent of a fire in an oil refinery. The heat was so intense that the stone floor has vitrified, turned to glass. The thing about the fire here and the fires at all the other sites is that these were no accident. At Zakros, a little palace in the far east of the island, someone even went to the trouble of sawing off the necks of the pithoi so that the oil could ignite more easily. But what could have provoked these carefully planned acts of arson? And what lay behind this island-wide catastrophe? The cataclysm that would engulf Minoan civilization and pave the way for its ultimate destruction started here, 70 miles north of Crete, on an island called Thera. Thera is the southernmost of the Greek Cycladic islands, perfectly placed to act as a middleman for the trade routes that ran north from Crete to the Greek mainland and across to the coasts of Asia Minor. The Therans weren't Minoans, but they were under the spell of Minoan culture. Their pottery, their houses, their way of life, all followed a pattern set by the big island to the south. Thera had grown fat on the profits of Bronze Age haulage, but its prosperity was built on shaky foundations because the island of Thera is one big volcano. At some point around 1530 BC, the island began to stir. First came a series of earthquakes, so severe that most of the towns had to be abandoned. But the gods were just getting warmed up. A few months later, things got really nasty. Ten times more powerful than the eruption of Vesuvius that buried Pompeii, four times greater than Krakatoa, the eruption of Thera was a true cataclysm. A third of the island's landmass, some 30 million cubic meters of hills and fields and towns, was tossed 20 miles into the air or slipped into the sea. The rest was buried beneath a blanket of ash and stones to a depth of 40 meters. It's just 70 miles from Thera's crater to the north coast of Crete. And so the Minoans had ringside seats for the death of their island neighbor. First, they would have heard the earth tremors, distant, unmistakable, and all too horribly familiar. Mother nature throwing another tantrum. But after the tremors, something new and disturbing, a dark stain spreading over the northern horizon, the volcano stoking itself up for the grand finale. And when the eruption finally came, it would have been like an atom bomb going off, the afterglow visible from Crete's peak sanctuaries. But the gods weren't finished yet. Now it was the Minoans' turn to feel their anger. Centuries later, 
A Roman traveller was eyewitness to the after-effects of seismic activity in this part of the world. He described how the sea hauled itself back from the shore, leaving in the abyss of the deep sea creatures stuck fast in the slime. It must have been a ghastly and unnatural sight, but it was merely a prelude to what happened just minutes later. At first, a low, distant roar, growing louder all the time, and then a wall of water racing towards you at the speed of an express train. The impact of the tsunami following Thera varied across the northern coast of Crete. In some places, there were waves between 10 and 20 feet tall. Impressive enough, but here at Moklos, it's estimated that they reached 100 feet high. That's higher than the island itself. It would have swamped the town, plucking boats out of the sea and spewing them up far inland. The eruption of Thera is one of those epoch-making catastrophes that can change the course of human history. But for the Minoans, this wasn't apocalypse now. The effects of Thera on Crete would be played out over a period of some 90 years. Not a sudden execution, but a slow, painful death. After the tidal wave would have come the ash clouds, blotting out the sun, smothering the fields, poisoning water supplies, suffocating plants and animals. The effects would have varied across the island, with the east the worst hit. But farming in the Bronze Age was a fragile affair, and it wouldn't have taken much to jeopardise the harvest. If the effects of Thera were as profound as many believe, Widespread famine would have marked the beginning of a long and troubled era for Crete. Ultimately, it would pave the way for the violent climax of 1450 BC, when Aya Triada and other major centres of Minoan power went up in flames. Close to the palace of Knossos, a discovery has been made that could cast some light on conditions in Minoan Crete following the Theron catastrophe. Archaeologists found a jumble of human bones scattered around a late Minoan house. The remains have been identified as belonging to at least four children, aged between eight and ten. They seem to have been in good health when they died. Their flesh has been sliced away from the bone. You can see the cut marks here. The method is identical to that which Minoans used for carving sheep. Some of the remains were found in a cooking pot along with the shells of edible snails. For many archaeologists, this is direct evidence of cannibalism, whether for ritual purposes or simply because the Minoans were starving. In the aftermath of Thera, a search for scapegoats seems highly likely. And it wasn't just humans who might have been on the receiving end of people's anger. When the snake goddess and her follower were discovered at Knossos, they'd been broken into pieces before being interred in an underfloor vault. Perhaps this was how the Minoans negotiated the delicate business of decommissioning a once powerful deity whose protective force had apparently deserted her, carefully disposing of her like radioactive waste. With the old gods in disgrace, this was a heaven-sent opportunity for new cults and new gods to assert their claims. Around this time, a new style of decorative pottery appears, with a gallery of creatures from the slimy deep. According to some, this suggests a shift of focus away from the earth and towards the sea, which had just revealed with awesome emphasis its destructive powers. So was this how the sophisticated and apparently stable Minoan civilization collapsed? Not blown apart by a natural disaster, but undermined by wars of religion that followed the cataclysm. 
A recent discovery may hold a tantalizing clue to the forces that would finally tear Minoan civilization apart. I think this has to be one of the most poignant and beautiful artefacts to have been discovered in Crete. He's called a kouros, which means a boy. He would have been decorated with rock crystal and gold, and his body is made of hippopotamus ivory. The choice of that material, which was valuable and exotic, combined with his stance, which is sublime, yet with a quiet power, suggests that what we have here is no mere boy. This is a boy god. The quality of the workmanship is simply staggering. The veins, arteries, sinews and bones rendered with an almost fanatical realism. But of course, what strikes you first about the figure is its desecration. Those scorched, blackened limbs, the face sliced off, reminiscent of a Catholic saint in the English Reformation. And this boy has been symbolically and physically emasculated. His genitals are torn away. Despite his perfection, or perhaps because of it, this young god provoked in someone a passionate hatred. The remains were found in Palacastro, an important Minoan town at the eastern end of Crete. The litter of burned fragments was scattered around a purpose-built shrine in which the kouros would have been displayed. When the shrine was first excavated, the telltale signs of fire damage soon appeared. But this was no ordinary fire. Like the one at Aya Triada, it was started deliberately. In fact, the fire's ferocity was intensified by blocking up doorways to create a through draft, like a blast furnace. The result was a kind of controlled explosion that tore the place apart. Then the attackers turned their attention to the Kouros. The Kouros was snatched from the sanctuary, broken at its base, and then smashed face first against this doorpost. Its head, its neck and one of its arms flew off a couple of yards over there. Its torso and its remaining arm fell where I'm standing. Its hair, which would have been made of finely wrought gold filaments, was carried off on the wind generated by the fire. And finally, its legs, which had served as a convenient handhold, were tossed back into the sanctuary, where they burnt at temperatures of over 1,800 degrees. When times get tough, even the most outward-looking cultures can turn in on themselves. And despite the long Minoan tradition of artistic innovation, the social dislocation caused by Thera may have brought more fundamentalist instincts to the surface. Maybe there was something about the Kouros that was just too new, too alien. To some, it may have seemed a graven image or a foreign god. But perhaps the greatest affront was that this was a male god. There may never have been a single mother goddess in Crete, but what's certain is that female goddesses and priestesses were highly visible and possibly even dominant. So what it seems to me is that the Kouros represents a breakaway cult. Following the spectacular failure of the goddesses to protect Crete after Thera, they were demoted and the honours usually afforded to them appropriated by what had previously been a minor male god. So what happened here at Palacastro could perhaps have been the revenge of scorned women against an upstart boy. A 
A civil war sparked by religion is only one of a number of theories that might explain why Minoan civilization collapsed sometime around 1450 BC. All we do know for sure is that by then, Greek-speaking Mycenaeans from the mainland were installed at Knossos. Whether they came as conquerors or simply stepped in to pick up the pieces isn't clear. But they were, in many ways, the last Minoans, rebuilding some of the ports and palaces that had been destroyed, putting the island back on its feet. For the next two centuries, the fortunes of the Minoans and the Mycenaeans were inextricably linked. According to Homer, one of the largest contingents of ships for the Mycenaean assault on Troy came from Crete. But if the islanders shared in the triumphs of the mainlanders, they would also share their fate. Around 1200 BC, Mycenaean power on the Greek mainland was destroyed. Massive tribal movements, slave revolts, civil war have all been blamed. But whatever it was that did for the Mycenaeans, it didn't confine itself to the mainland. Sooner or later, it crossed the sea and found its way to Crete. The remnant of Minoan civilization was forced to take refuge in remote mountain hideouts like this one, Carphi. When we talk about the death of a civilization, it conjures up apocalyptic visions tinged with flames and blood. But for the Minoans, the end came creeping in like a chill mist. In this bleak and inhospitable landscape, the final chapter of their amazing history would be written. Those refugees who first made their way up here in the troubled 12th century BC must have found very little to love about Carthy. No bull leaping or ecstatic dancing here. Just time to watch the clouds roll into the Lasithi Plateau and spot the vultures circling in the skies overhead. And all the while, anxiously scanning the horizon for any signs that the cataclysm which had enveloped the coast was feeling its way up to this mountainside hideout. never know for sure exactly why the Minoans abandoned their palaces and set out for places like Carthy. But what I think you can say with absolute certainty, standing here on the edge of the world, is that the people who came here were very, very scared. So scared that it would take a hundred years before they dared to venture back down to the lowlands. Mm -hmm.